Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Hare Krishna. Good morning, everyone. So thank you so much for coming this morning to this class on the Srimad Bhagavatam. So today we're reading from Canto number 10, chapter number 51, entitled The Deliverance of Muchukunda. And today we're reading from text number 46. Labdva jano dur labha matra manusham Kathanchira vyanga matyat natog naga Kathanchira vyanga matyat natog naga Padar vindam nabajatya sanmati Grihan the coupe patito yatapashu. The dvajano dur labamatramanusham. Katanchi the vyanga mayatnato naga. Pada vindam nabajatya san mati. Grihan the coupe patito yatapashu. Labdhajan odor labamatra manusham. Katan chida vyanga mayatna to naga. Pada vindam nabajatya san mati. Grihan the coupe. Patito yathapashu.
matematicis. Labdhva, attaining, Janaha, a person, Durlabham, really obtained, Atra, in this world, Manusham, the human form of life, Katanchit, somehow or other, Avyangam, with undistorted limbs, unlike the various animal forms. Ayatnataha, without endeavor. Anagha, O sinless one. Pada, your feet. Aravindam, lotus-like. Nabhajati, he does not worship. Asat, impure. Matihi, his mentality. Griha of home, Andha blind, Kupe in the well, Patita fallen, Yatha as Pashu an animal. Translation and purport by the disciples of His Divine Grace Shalasi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Ki. Translation. That person has an impure mind. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that person has an impure mind who, despite having somehow or other obta automatically obtained the rare and highly evolved human form of life, does not worship your lotus feet. Like an animal that has fallen into a blind well, such a person has fallen into the darkness of a material home. Purport. Our real home is in the kingdom of God. Despite our tenacious determination to remain in our material home, death will really eject us from the theater of material affairs. To stay at home is not bad nor is it bad to devote ourselves to our loved ones. But we must understand that our real home is eternal in the spiritual kingdom. The word ayatnataha indicates that human life has been automatically awarded to us. We have not constructed our human bodies and therefore we should not foolishly claim this body is mine. The human form is a gift of God and should be used to achieve the perfection of God consciousness. One who does not understand this is Asan Mati, possessed of dull, mundane understanding. Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya mano bhishtam stapitam yena bhutale svayam rupa kadamayam dadati svapadantikam vandeham shri guru shri yuta padakamalan shri guru vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathanvitam Dam Sajivam 
साद्वैतम सावधूतम बरिजना सहितम कृष्णा चेतन्य देवम श्री राधा कृष्ण पादान सहगना ललिता श्री विशाखान वितम हे कृष्णा करुणा सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेशा गोपिका कांता राधा कांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचा कल्पतरुभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम श्रीकृष्णा चैतन्य प्रभो निनांद श्रीअद्वैतगदाधर श्रीवासदिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे श्री प्रभुपाद की थैंक यू एवरीवन फॉर कमिंग बिफोर आई बिगिन आई रिक्वेस्ट द ब्लेसिंग्स एंड परमिशन ऑफ माय सीनियर्स ट्राई टू शेयर some thoughts as we hear about muchukunda muchukunda has come out of his sleep this is a historic moment an auspicious moment in the west they have a saying sleep is my drug the bed is the drug dealer and the alarm clock is the police <laughs> so sleep is uh, such a formidable enemy just the other day we came for mangalarti at shila prabhupad samadhi and it was packed there were so many it was hardly space to come in <coughs> and then his grace panchagoda prabhu he came to me and he said see shila prabhupad still waking everyone up <laughs> so it was nice because yes shila prabhupad gives darshan uh at 10 past 4 in the morning and therefore we get up but not just that shila prabhupada is waking us up to the reality of the purpose of life not just physically waking us up but spiritually waking us up uh sleeping in the lap of maya uh pisachira the witch in the the witch of maya we're sleeping in the lap and therefore <clears throat> overcoming sleep is the first uh, step in awakening ourselves to the spiritual reality therefore in spiritual culture uh is always recommended that one is minimizing their sleep actually it said that there's only everyone is sleeping excessively in the world but there's only three types of people it said who are not sleeping excessively it's only three types of people who can't sleep at night the bhogi the rogi and the yogi the bhogi means the one who is uh, intensely seeking material enjoyment and therefore they cannot sleep at night because they're in anxiety how will i achieve this how will i achieve that maybe someone will take something away from me too many anxieties therefore chintam aparimeyam cha pralayantam upashrita kam upa bhoga parama etavad iti nischita krishna says the demoniac person has so many desires uh, and therefore they have so many anxieties and because the bhogi has so many anxieties they can't sleep at night and then it said the rogi they cannot sleep at night because the rogi means one who is sick even when you want to sleep if you're diseased you cannot sleep of course shilaprabhad was never asleep 
But even Srila Prabhupada, he said in the final days, I think it's mentioned in Tamar Krishna Maharaj's diary, Prabhupada said, throughout my life, I never did uh, mating and defending. And now in my old age, Krishna isn't even allowing me to do sleeping and eating. So when the health goes, when one is diseased, then even then they cannot sleep. But then the other person who is not sleeping at night is the yogi. The one who is awake, jagrato, awake to the uh, ultimate purpose of life. And uh, now Muchukunda has awakened uh, from his long slumber. In these beautiful prayers of Muchukunda, he's saying, May I not go back to sleep again? Uh, because yes, to be a yogi means to minimize your sleep. Even Guda, uh, Arjun was known as Gudakesh, isn't it? One who conquered sleep. We hear the famous story in the Mahabharata of how one time Arjun was eating, isn't it? And somehow the sun had gone down and there was a lamp and he was eating. And then the wind blew the lamp out. And in the dark, he continued eating. He realized, my God, in the dark, my hand can still find my mouth. <laughs> Mystical. Then he realized, if I can eat in the dark without even seeing if my hand can find my mouth in the dark, then surely I should be able to also practice archery. Surely my arrow should reach the target at night also. And therefore he said he began practicing at night time while everyone else was sleeping. He was awake, practicing, not wasting any time. And therefore he became accomplished as the greatest archer. <coughs> Here we are in Vrindavan and the Goswamis, they were also Nidra Hara Vihara Kadi Vijito Chatyanta Dino Chayo Nidra, ahara, eating, sleeping, all of these things were minimized uh, because they were so absorbed in Krishna. The minimization came automatically for the Goswamis because they were so absorbed. In the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Rupa Goswami is explaining that there are different symptoms of bhav. Rupagoswami says, as you uh, develop bhav, transcendental ecstasy, there will be certain observable symptoms. And one of the observable symptoms is virakti. That one naturally becomes detached. One naturally becomes uh, indifferent to the pushings of the body because of spiritual absorption. Some people think the Goswamis were going and sleeping under a different tree every night so that they wouldn't get attached. But actually our Acharyas say the reason why they were going tree to tree every night is because under every single tree Krishna was revealing to them all the different pastimes that he performed there. And therefore they were naturally interested, let us move from tree to tree. And then the renunciation was coming automatically. Uh, this is virakti, the difference between vairagya and virakti. Vairagya is a type of renunciation that we perform out of knowledge, out of discipline, knowing that it's good for us. But when one becomes sufficiently advanced, then virakti, the uh, detachment comes. So, nidra hara vihara gadi. The Goswamis were minimizing sleep. Srila Prabhupada himself, um, as we hear from Srila Prabhupada's disciples, was uh, hardly sleeping. I think it was Guru Kripa Prabhu on a, uh, on a memories, he was saying, he was describing how Srila Prabhupada would sleep. I think the way he described it, he said, 
Srila Prabhupada would sometimes cross his hands on his chest and lie down. He said there was never any snoring. And he said as soon as Srila Prabhupada woke up, there was, he was just like fresh, like ready. Usually for us it takes some time to get the engine going again after sleeping. So Srila Prabhupada, he was hardly... Uh, to Mar Krishna Maharaj, in, a, in another memories, he explains one time he was in a car with Srila Prabhupada and he said, Srila Prabhupada didn't like it when the devotees would fall asleep and doze off in the car. So he said he was next to Srila Prabhupada and he was dozing off. So Srila Prabhupada tapped him and said, you're sleeping. He said, no, no, Srila Prabhupada, no, 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 I'm not sleeping. <laughs> Prabhupada said, no, no, you're sleeping. He said, no, no, Prabhupada, I don't think I was sleeping. Prabhupada said, you are sleeping, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and then in that memory, Tamar Krishna Maharaj says, another time he was in the car with Srila Prabhupada at the back. And in the front, I think it was Upendra Prabhu. And Tamar Krishna Maharaj says, Upendra Prabhu was dozing off in the front. And so, they, Tamar Krishna Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada, they could both see so Tamar Krishna Maharaj was seeing what Srila Prabhupada would do. And then he said, as uh, Upendra was dozing off, Srila Prabhupada reached forward and just caught hold of his sikha. <laughs> and so when he, when he dozed off, then his head jerked. And then Upendra, he looked back and he thought, that must be Tamar Krishna Maharaj. <laughs> so he got angry at him, but he didn't realize it was actually Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada was uh, training the devotees that uh, not to waste life uh, sleeping. When sleeping is more exciting than being awake, then it means our life is not exciting enough. They say the best alarm clock in the world is purpose. Because when the eyes open and we have purpose, uh, there's no reason not to come out. So, of course, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that we have to be also balanced. Krishna says one cannot be a yogi if one eats too much or eats too little. If one sleeps too much or sleeps too little. And therefore uh, one must also be regulated. Yuktahara, viharasya, yukjateshasya, karmasu. One must be regulated in all these things. Maybe also devotees have also gone to the other extreme of trying to neglect their sleep. Uh, many cars have been crashed in the Krishna consciousness movement because devotees didn't get enough sleep. Prabhupada had to forbid night driving in two letters. Yeah. Because the two devotees in Ohio, 1969, they died of a car crash. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, many cars have been crashed, many bodies have been destroyed. Many tra many stops have been missed on a train. <laughs> One devotee did that once. He missed the he's sleeping, he, he missed the stop on the train. He had to go two hours forward, two hours back. So we have to also be balanced and uh, also uh, ensure that we get enough sleep. But the point here is that Muchukunda has come out of his sleep and therefore he's now praying. Uh, let me not waste it. Let me not now go back to sleep. That happens to us, isn't it? When the alarm clock goes off in the morning, one type of person doesn't even hear it. The second type of person hears it but shuts it down and goes back to sleep. The third type of person hears the alarm clock, wakes up, but then just lies awake in bed. 
And then the fourth type of person gets up, but then they take like one hour, one and a half hours to get ready just to, you know. So when the alarm clock goes off, there's still many ways in which we still remain asleep, even though we're awake. And this is basically what Muchukunda is praying that we don't do. Because the alarm clock has gone off. We've woken up. But have we woken up? Is there a chance that we could go back to sleep again? Yes, that's very much a possibility. And therefore, uh, I was on Parikrama yesterday and you know, so many dogs are there. Srila Prabhupada would often say in his lectures, quoting Chanakya, that there are six things you can learn from a dog. The first thing is that a dog, if it has food, it eats to its heart con heart's content. First lesson. Second lesson, if the dog doesn't have food, then it's content. It can still continue functioning. Third lesson is that a dog is fiercely loyal to its master. Fourth lesson from a dog is that it's very courageous. See? <laughs> Very brave, courageous. And then the fifth lesson you can learn from a dog is that it can sleep anywhere. And the sixth lesson that Srila Prabhupada said you can learn from a dog is that as soon as it wakes up, it's immediately active. That's actually a profound lesson. Once I was walking on the Parikrama Marg actually and I accidentally stepped on the dog <laughs> and immediately like rah, like immediately awake you know active you know alert alive so that's actually a profound lesson that once we are awake we have to really be awake and uh, therefore you'll see when the devotees are awakened to this knowledge, you find all these stutis, these prayers in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that they're praying, let me never go to sleep again. Let me not be inattentive. Let me not waste this opportunity. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, in the final part of the Madhya Leela, it's very, very beautiful because what Mahaprabhu is doing he is grounding uh, the whole uh, Gaudiya uh, Siddhanta in the hearts of Rupa and Sanatan Goswamis. And there in Varanasi, when Mahaprabhu is instructing Sanatan Goswami, then he's giving many, many beautiful analogies. And one of the amazing and beautiful things that Mahaprabhu tells Sanatan Goswami is the story of the astrologer. He tells uh, Sanatan Goswami this story that there is one astrologer called Sarva Gya, one who knows everything. And Sarva Gya, he goes to a home of a very poor person. And he does the astrology of this very, very uh, poverty stricken person. And he says, I can't understand why you're living like this. Because in your chart, you're a rich person. In your chart, there's a great treasure which is awaiting for you. But the thing is, you don't know where it is. And therefore, you haven't gone time to go there and excavate the treasure. But you don't know that your father, he was a rich man. But before he could tell you where that treasure was, he disappeared. And therefore, let me now tell you where that treasure is, where you have to dig to find that wealth. And he says, as you go and search for this treasure, don't go to the south. Because if you go to the south side, then there is a poisonous wasps. And the poisonous wasps represent fruitive activity overcome again by uh, karmic karma kanda, or some kind of material enjoyment. You become diverted. Don't go there. He said, don't go to the north, because in the north there's a black snake. 
And that black snake will devour you if you try to find the treasure there. And the black snake represents the yogis who try to meditate and merge and uh, uh, become overcome by uh, all kinds of uh, desires for liberation. And then he says, don't go to the west side. Because on the west side there's a ghost. And that ghost represents speculation and uh, all kinds of knowledge stolen away by illusion. He says, don't go there, you'll again miss the opportunity. He says, therefore, there's a great treasure. And be careful, don't go in any of these directions, but rather go to the eastern side. And in the eastern side, you will uh, easily find that treasure. It's a very, very beautiful story because it's teaching us that, yes, now we're awakened. Srila Prabhupada, the Acharyas, they've awakened us to where that treasure is. So now we have to be awake to that. It's very, very beautiful when we see in our scriptures how once someone gets the call, there's no hesitation. They just walk that path. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, Miniketan Aram, had come to his family home and was offended. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami could understand this is a great uh, misfortune. We have offended a Vaishnav in our home. If this happens, then everything is lost. So he was lamenting, lamenting. And then that very night, Nityananda Prabhu came to him. Hare Hare Krishna Das Nakaraha Bhai Vrindavana Yahataha Sarvala Bhai Nityananda came to him in a dream and said, Hare Hare Krishna Das, so oh my dear Krishna Das, Nakaraha Bhai, don't worry about anything. Vrindavana Yahataha, when you wake up tomorrow morning, just go to Vrindavan, Sarvala Bhai. And there in Vrindavan you will achieve everything. So it's amazing that Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, the very next morning, he just woke up and there was no hesitation. He just left. He didn't know where he was going, what he would do, where he would live, how he would survive. But the call came and therefore he walked the path. Sometimes we don't know the whole journey. Just like now, it's very, very... This morning we were walking to Mangalarti and you can hardly see your hand in front of you. And you think, how are we going to make it there? But as soon as you walk forward, then the rest of the path is revealed. And as you walk a little further forward, the rest of the path is revealed. Sometimes we don't know the whole path of our spiritual life, where the beginning is, where the end is, where the middle is. And therefore we feel, how can I walk the path? But the devotee, when they get the call, even though they may not understand the full journey of how it's going to walk, work, they still walk the path. And as they walk, Krishna reveals more and more and more. So Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, when he got the call, when he woke up, he didn't go back to sleep. Neither did he go back to sleep physically, neither did he go back to sleep spiritually, but he was fully awake to the call. And therefore he walked that path and he came to Vrindavan. Nityananda Prabhu said, Sarva Labya Hai, you'll get everything here. And what happened? Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami got everything. He got the most exalted association in the universe, the association of the Goswamis of Vrindavan. He got the most exalted residence in the entire universe, Shauta at Sri Radha Kund. He got the most exalted service in the whole universe, the opportunity to document the life and times of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And in this way, Sarva Labya Hai, he received everything. Because when the call came, he never hesitated. So in our life, the call comes. The instructions of the spiritual master come. 
Sometimes the instructions of the spiritual master have to be delayed. But those instructions can never be denied. And therefore as soon as the instructions come, the disciple is always awake to those instructions. And even if it's not possible to fulfill them immediately, the disciple is always meditating, internally preparing, evolving, uh, developing themselves towards the point where they can fully embrace the call of the spiritual master, the call of Krishna. And so here, Muchukunda, in this very beautiful prayer, is saying, uh, Let me not now fall, griham, andakupam. Uh, Prahlad Maharaj says the same thing to Hiranyakashipu. Uh, Hitvatmapatam grihamandakupam vanam gato yad dharim ashrayeta. If you've fallen into the dark well of materialistic life, then immediately you must come out and you must go to the forest, take shelter of Krishna. So today we uh, meditate on this as Muchukunda has uh, woken up and now doesn't want to go back to sleep. There is a possibility that we can wake up and still go back to sleep or still be asleep. And uh, that is the danger that we have to try to avoid. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So I'll open it up here to see, uh, maybe there are some comments from senior Vaishnavas, or if anyone uh, has any questions or anything I'd like to ask. I'll just ask first if uh, seniors <coughs> You mentioned, you mentioned of course, when you were with Srila Prabhupada, you got to see very often how he didn't appreciate seeing his disciples sleeping, and other than when it was bedtime. So I'll just tell one one instance was on a very big 747, and. I was with Srila Prabhupada, so he always sat at the window seat, and I was sitting right next to him. And it was a short flight. It was just from New York to Detroit, which is like one hour flight. And 747 was, at the time, it was the jumbo jet, they would call. So you had three seats, then you had like five in the middle, and three seats. So because everyone knew Prabhupada was traveling from to New York to Detroit, many of the devotees they wanted to be on the same plane as Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> so they knew where Srila Prabhupada was sitting. So Prabhupada was there, I'm next to him. And then all across were all devotees, all saffron clad, shaved head, tilak. And the plane takes off. This is 10 o'clock in the morning, and the plane's filled with so many other people. And Prabhupada sitting, and of course, his hand in his bead bag and his chanting. And I'm sitting next to him, and Prabhupada's looking, and as all you would see was <laughs> one after another. Of course, these same devotees were the ones that were up all night preparing New York Temple for Srila Prabhupada's arrival. So we were very often sleep deprived. But nonetheless, Prabhupada didn't like it, and they see the heads just going, Phew. And Prabhupada looks at me, why are they sleeping? <laughs> and I would never say anything. I didn't know what, what, what can you say? Why are they sleeping? Because there's no good excuse for Srila Prabhupada. Even if I say, well, Prabhupada, probably they didn't sleep all. No, that's, you can't give any reason. You say, look, everyone on the plane is awake except the devotees. <laughs> sleeping very comfortably, he would say. He said all the karmis, when it, and Prabhupada would say karmis, he, he would use that word. He would say all the karmis working very hard, he say, for to support their families, for their sex life. No, not the devotees, sleeping very comfortably, he would say. 
But it was one of just dozens of times, myself, the entourage, anywhere all the time. Sleeping, as you said very nicely, is the very first thing we have to conquer over. But I can tell you from my personal experience, it can take a long time to conquer <laughs> over that desire to sleep. <laughs> Still working on it, but uh, yes. And then he would go on the other extreme. We would listen to him all the time, telling us, sleep less, eat less. So when you're traveling with him, this, you hear this every day, just like your Prabhupada's classes were all philosophy, instructing us what to do. So we would sometimes do that, and he would condemn sleeping too much. So we were in Mayapur, and his Sanskrit editor, our Pandaji, he was, as all of us, he was very fond of prashadam. Prajumna liked prashadam, you know. But he's hearing Prabhupada's lectures, sleeping too much, have to reduce sleeping, have to reduce eating. So every morning we would have breakfast on the veranda, right outside Prabhupada's room in Mayapur. And Prabhupada, he would come out and he would just look to see what we were eating. Always interested to see. He wouldn't, he was always aloof, hand in his bee bag, but he saw everything. We saw everything going on. The one day, he told the Bengali brahmachari who's serving, he said something to him as he was serving me. So what did Prabhupada said? He said he told me to give you a lot of japatis. <laughs> <laughs> and then Prabhupada looked at me. He said, "Where's Prajumna?" I said, "Oh, Prabhupada, he's he's in the room chanting." He said, "Why isn't he taking prasadam?" He's asking me. I said, well, Prabhupada, I said, he's trying to reduce his eating. Prajumna found somewhere, one Shastra, but, you know, you can live on milk and he would eat eight al almonds, blanch almonds overnight, take the skins off, and that, he thought he was going to survive on that because, because Prabhupada said, sleep less. So then he goes into the room where Prajumna is, and Prajumna is sitting on the floor, and he's surrounded by his books, <laughs> like, like a wall of books, Prajumna Pandaji. Prabhupada once said, he's carrying so many books, he doesn't read any of them. He said. <laughs> Prajumna, why aren't you taking breakfast with the devotees? Prabhupada, he said, if I... If I eat, he said, if I eat too much, he said, then I, I sleep. Prabhupada looked at him. He said, how can you do your service without eating? He said, sleep 10 hours if you have to sleep. He said, but you have to take prasadam and do your service. Yes, Prabhupada. So he would say, but then he was not, it was not a question of, um, as you say, false renunciation. It's a process. Like I say now, anyone will tell you, I sit down, why aren't you eating? Even my god brother, because it doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't digest anymore. So everything comes in its own time. But Prabhupada always encouraged us from both sides. You're, you're eating, you're not eating. Whatever we did, we were wrong. That was, <laughs> that was the basic lesson. We're always wrong in front of Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. Okay. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful. <coughs> uh, Hare Krishna Maharaji. Please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you so much for such a wonderful class. Uh, my question <coughs> was that, that uh, just yesterday I was reading a book uh, and I read this uh, particular sentence which I have also read in Prabhupada's book, that the advancement of a devotee in Krishna consciousness depends on his attitude. So, uh, my question was that, uh, what is that attitude, right attitude, and how to maintain that in our progress in Bhakti? Thank you. So, what is the, Srila Prabhupada says, the advancement is dependent upon the attitude. What is that attitude? So, Rupa Goswami is explaining 
उत्साह निश्चय धैर्य तत्त कर्म प्रवर्तनत संगत्यागत सतो वृते सद्भिर भक्तिर प्रसिद्यति there are principles which are favorable to the advancement of your devotional life one be enthusiastic to be patient be determined be confident follow uh, the regulations the lives of the acharyas uh, give up non devotee association this is the disposition shila prabhupad often if you read the folio he specifically emphasizes enthusiasm and patience as the ideal attitude if one is patient but they're not enthusiastic that's the mode of ignorance if one is enthusiastic but they're not patient that's the mode of passion but when one is enthusiastic tempered by patience then that's the mode of goodness and when we perform devotional service with that kind of disposition then it has a uh, powerful effect and then of course there are so many other things you know to be humble to be tolerant titikshava karunika surida sarvadehi nam the way we deal with others so many aspects so thank you anyone else would like to hari krishna maharaj Yeah. thank you so much for such a wonderful lecture and uh, please accept my humble obeisances so uh, maharaj uh, as you said that uh, when the call comes the devotee never hesitate but uh, as especially for me as i say that uh, sometimes the taste for material things uh, Uh, they are we are there in the association of devotees such wonderful devotees devotees are very compassionate they always try to help us but uh, but still being in the association sometimes the taste for material things so strong that uh, that don't allow us to uh, uh, just take us back to that uh, thing again and again and uh, and uh, something it feel after some time it feel very uh, very regret in the heart that uh, what i am doing and uh, and uh, and if we uh, we continue doing like this then that mercy of the devotee is just like krishna's mercy will stop coming and but the devotees are very merciful they will they will saw but that is also sometime uh, it is very means uh, it's an offense to the devotees so how to tackle that that how to uh, be so strong that we don't go back to that material thing and again and again and that call comes is totally surrender thank you, thank you. <coughs> it will uh it will take time therefore enthusiasm and patience in the bhagavatam there's a beautiful verse jata shraddha mat katha shu nirvina sarva karma shu वेद दुखात्मकान कामान परित्यागे पनीश्वरा वो डू अ सर्वे हियर टू सी इफ इट रिलेट्स टू यू फर्स्ट लाइन सेस जात श्रद्धा मत कथा शु देयर इज अ डिवोटी हु हैज अवेकेंड फेथ इन द नरेशंस ऑफ द सुप्रीम लॉर्ड एंड द फिलॉसफी ऑफ द भागवतम पुट योर हैंड अप इफ यू हैव डेवलप्ड सम फेथ इन द भागवतम ओके यू क्वालिफाई जात श्रद्ध मत कथाशु निर्विना सर्व कर्म शु एंड दैट डिवोटी नोज दैट इफ आई एंगेज इन मटेरियल थिंग्स आई विल एंड अप मिजरेबल पुट योर हैंड अप इफ यू नो दैट ओके वेद दुखात मकान कामान परित्यागे प्यनीश्वर बट इवन दो दे नो ऑल ऑफ दो थिंग्स स्टिल दे अन एबल टू गिव अप material activities okay there you go you qualify so the first verse defines the problem you've awakened faith you know material life is miserable but you're not able to give it up thankfully there's a verse after which gives the solution <laughs> tato bhaje tamam prita shraddhalu drita nischaya uh, what's the next sign 
Okay, I forgot the last two lines. But the first two are most important anyway. Tato bhajeta maam prita shraddhalur dhrida nishchaya If one is in this situation, what can they do? The Bhagavatam says, Tato bhajeta maam prita You just have to carry on serving with love. And all the while praying to the Lord that I know this is not helping me. I know this is not beneficial to me. Please give me the strength to give it up. Some problems you can't solve in your head. Many problems you can't even solve through your own efforts. But what we do is in our head we make it clear. With our efforts we give everything we have. But then you have to get on your knees and you have to pray to Krishna. Give me the strength. Therefore the Bhagavatam is full of prayers. Because at a certain point you realize knowledge and effort just isn't good enough. I need to pray to Krishna. And uh, maybe if uh, I become a little sincere from my heart, then Krishna will give me the strength. It just takes, uh, actually it just takes a sincere mantra chanted to Krishna and Krishna will free you. <laughs> but it takes a long time. Eka Krishna nama kare sarve papakshoi. Eka Krishna nam is enough. But to get to that Eka Krishna nam, to get to that one mantra, you have to do a lot of mantras before. But one mantra is enough. Uh, there's a beautiful verse that uh, what is that verse um, okay I can't remember it if one chants my name once with devotion that one is there but there's another one Bengali verse uh, then Krishna says, Maya bande hoite Krishna tare kare paal. I free them from Maya immediately. So I think it's a matter of becoming prayerful. In my life I felt at some point I was not so prayerful. But the path of bhakti is a path of prayer. It's a life of prayer. So there comes a point when you realize we just have to pray. And not that we don't do everything else, we do. But without that added element of prayer, it won't work. That's what came to my mind. I'm sure there's many ways to answer that question, but that's what came to me today. Um, okay. Give Mataji's a question. May want to give the ladies opportunity. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. <coughs> Thank you so much. Um, I really liked your analogy of the fog, walking in the fog, that uh, we can't see where we're going and we can't always even see how we're getting there, but it is revealed as we go along, little by little. But I was thinking there are so many unknowns in Krishna consciousness. You know, internally there are so many unknowns. Even externally, practically speaking, what we're meant to do in this world, there are so many unknowns <coughs> as far as the future goes. And uh, sometimes we also get um, contradictory instructions. You know, like y y you're not sure what to do, and you, one devotee says, oh, uh, uh, you should just be detached. Another devotee says, no, you really need to do something about this. Uh, so what to do, you know? It's not always so clear, even in the present. So I'll begin with that and then come back. So sometimes we get contradictory instructions. It's interesting here as Grace Shruti Kirti Prabhu was saying even it seemed Prabhupada often gave contradictory instructions. And it's interesting even if you read Shastra 
it can seemingly be contradictory instructions. So Holiness Rida Ananda Maharaj says a nice thing about the seeming contradictions in Shastra. He said they're like literary speed bumps. So you know like when you go on a, a, a road, <coughs> there's speed bumps which are extremely annoying. But the speed bumps are there to make you become more conscious about how you're driving and more conscious about your environment around you. Otherwise you just speed on. Uh, completely oblivious to everything around you. So sometimes Shastra and sometimes even the Vaishnavas, they give us seemingly contradictory instructions to help us think more deeply. What is the essence? What is the principle? How does it relate to my life? So sometimes those contradictory <coughs> instructions are a beautiful mechanism to actually help us to think more deeply about our journey. If someone just came to us and just kept on giving us the answers in a very clear way, probably we'd go throughout our whole life and be unconscious and not really think deeply. The other reason that contradictory instructions are there is because life is complicated and there are many aspects to life and there are many ways to view things and two statements which seemingly are opposite don't necessarily have to be contradictory but can be true from their own perspectives. If I say to you who was born first, the son or the father, then it seems like an obvious point. Of course the father was born first. The father is born before the son. But then I could say no, until the son was born he wasn't a father. He was just a man. So the son is born and then he becomes a father. Now here you have two contradictory statements that are seemingly contradictory but what are they? They're actually paradoxical. They can be reconciled on a deeper level. And so when we seemingly get different uh, instructions we should see how to understand the essence of those instructions. Mm. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he said, My spiritual master Gorkishore Das Babaji gave me three instructions and I followed them perfectly. Number one, never go to Calcutta. <laughs> Number two, don't open many temples. Number three, never make any disciples. He said he gave me three instructions, I followed them perfectly. I said, really? He said, yes, because when I went Calcutta, I never went to Calcutta. I stayed in the Bhag Bazaar Gaudiya Math, which is the spiritual world. I never made many disciples because I saw that all these souls who came to me were actually uh, sent by me as my spiritual master to teach me. And I never opened many temples because I didn't just open an institutional building, I opened up an embassy of the spiritual world. I was like, okay, you follow. <laughs> it was very interesting to be able, Sada Grahi Vaishnav, to be able to grasp the essence. So that is an art. And yes, there are many unknowns in life. Maybe that's how life is meant to be. Because unless we're willing to let go, how can we experience Krishna's embrace? So Krishna makes there, there, there has to be unknowns. Because that's our opportunity to let go. And when we let go, that's when we can feel the presence of Krishna more tangibly. We have a chronic tendency to want to hold on, to want to control. I was just in the plane coming here. Uh, actually not on this flight, on a different flight. And you know sometimes there's turbulence and I mean this time it was bad. Turbulence when you're in the air is one thing. Turbulence when you're going off on takeoff, that's like scary. But it's interesting when the plane goes voom, goes down, what's the first thing everyone does? They're like, <laughs> everyone holds on to their seat. So I was thinking about that. It's, it's actually completely irrational. I mean, if the plane's going down, holding onto your seat <laughs> ain't going to do anything. 
I mean, the, you can't, it's, 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 it's pointless. But we have this chronic tendency to try to want to control things. So Krishna makes these unknowns. Srila Prabhupada's life was always about going into the unknown. Srila Prabhupada got the dream to take sannyas. He said it was ghastly. But he made that step into the unknown. Srila Prabhupada got passage to go to America. It was a complete unknown, but he went. When Srila Prabhupada was in Butler, Pennsylvania, then he realized it wasn't happening there. So he said, I have to go to New York. He went into the unknown. In New York, Srila Prabhupada was in Dr. Mishra's apartment in Uptown. Prabhupada realized it's not the place. I need to go to the Lower East Side. When he couldn't go to the Lower East Side, that's the skid row. Prabhupada was ready to go into the unknown. So it seems as though Srila Prabhupada's life was just a continual journey into the unknown. And it seems that when the devotee makes the journey into the unknown, that's when you meet Krishna on the other side. So that's why it requires bravery. After some time in Krishna consciousness, you realize if you really want to do this path, you have to be extremely brave. You have to be extremely courageous. Uh, it's risky business. Krishna consciousness is risky business. <laughs> but big reward, yeah. The biggest risks have the biggest rewards. So, anyway, these are some thoughts. Okay, maybe last one, and then I guess we should stop. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Just carrying on from your aunt's devotee there um, about bhakti being a life of prayer. So personally, I see that in my case. Um, I can see that in many situations. My heart is full of blocks or knots. And I can see that actually what I need to do to overcome them is to pray intensely, as, is, as you're saying, you know, to get on your knees and beg Krishna to please help me overcome them. Because I can see that all I'm trying, that my own endeavor is not working. But I still have so much faith in my material ability to be able to overcome these knots and these blocks in my heart. And a, an easy example I can give is on Sankirtan, you know, that you're out there and you're trying, 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 nothing is happening. And you know on one side that I just really have to you know, that externally I have to make the effort, but what is really needed is that internal surrender, is that I just really have to beg. But there's so much pride there. So even though I know that this is what I have to do, there is so much pride in the heart that why do I have to beg? You know, can't Krishna see that I'm making such an effort? Why doesn't he reciprocate? So this arrogance is there. So, and I can see that this is actually preventing me from moving ahead. Yeah. So how do I overcome this? The material world is a humbling place. His Grace Burijan Prabhu is in Govardhan and you know like when you go around Vrindavan you see these sugar cane machines. Put that. So he saw the sugar cane machine and then he made a prayer. May the hard crushing wheel of life extract some humility from my offense hardened heart. And may the nectar of that humility give rise to pure love for Krishna. I was like, wow. Yes, I don't know if I wanted to have <laughs> May the hard crushing wheel of life extract some humility from my offense hardened heart. So the hard crushing wheel of life. Mrityu sam sada sagarat. Uh, but otherwise uh, there's different ways to get humble I guess that's one way 
Another way is by being in the presence of incredibly exalted personalities. One person came to Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He was an eminent person, he said. He said to his friend, I'll come and see the sadhu, but I'm not bowing down to him. I don't bow down to anyone. And he came into the room and unconsciously, against his own will, he just went down. <laughs> he said, I was going down. I was like, why am I going down? I don't bow down to anyone. Then he realized Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur's purity was so great that in the presence of such a personality, you realize, oh my God, I need that. who am I? So when, <laughs> when we're surrounded by such people, then we think, yes, uh, maybe I'm not as... So like this, there are different ways through knowledge, through association, through experience. We need all the help we can get because Trinada peace and each you can't, you know, the route to the spiritual world goes via that humility. You can't circumvent that. There's no other road that goes there. Every other road is blocked. <laughs> is there another route? Can I try a different way? No, 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 no. That. You have to go through that. So we're praying. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Grantaraj Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai.